Ken, you're listening to my first Tracks of My Years of 2024. My thanks to Gary Davis for sitting in over the festive period and I'm thrilled to welcome actor and singer Luke Evans. Born in Abergoid, Wales, Luke began his career in many of London's West End productions such as Rent, Miss Saigon and Piaf. But he didn't do his first film audition until he was 30, landing his first role as a Greek god, Apollo, in the 2010 remake of Clash of the Titans. And was subsequently cast in action and thriller films such as Immortals, The Raven and the reimagined The Three Musketeers. Before co-starring with Emily Blunt in The Girl on the Train, starring as Gaston in the live adaptation of Beauty and the Beast and in Our Son, he starred alongside Billy Porter as a divorcing couple. Lucas said that music is his first love and he shared a singing teacher with Charlotte Church. He's currently starring in Backstairs Billy, a new comedy play written by Michael Grandage about the 50-year relationship between the Queen Mother and a loyal servant, William Billy Talon. He stars alongside Penelope Wilson as the Queen Mother at the Duke of York's Theatre until January 27th. We'll kick off with your first tune of the week. This is Tears for Fears and Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Why have you picked, Luke, Everybody Wants to Rule the World? Well... A lot of these songs are from when I was a kid. The 80s, it was great, 80s and 90s. I loved the music from that time. And Tears for Fears just were this, such a cool band. And this song was just it's a traveling song. If You always play it in a car. You know, and I've always loved it. And then I did a movie about eight, nine years ago. And when the trailer came out, Lord had done the a version of it. And I was like, oh, it's on, my, it's on my movie. It was really cool. Dracula, everybody wants to rule the world. So, yeah, I've always loved it. And um, it never gets old. And music's your first love, right? Sounds like a song, that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it <laughs> Music is, is my first, first love. love. <laughs> yes, I mean, it is. I mean, I've always sung. I think even if I didn't do it professionally, I probably would have just loved singing. I love music. Music is always on in my house. I'm always singing something or other makes me happy and it's always with me you know I don't need an instrument I can just sing wherever I want oh that's a good way of looking at it yeah I never really looked at uh, singing like that you've always got music with you if you can yeah. just belt out a tune exactly. one thing that I really admire in your I get a page of everyone that comes in and does tracks in my ears yeah. is that your first job at River Island the clothes <laughs> shop you spent the money on singing lessons yeah that's brilliant <laughs> yeah it was the first class I ever had yeah yeah I used to finish I was worked in the footwear department when we used to sell kickers and uh, and I'd uh, I'd save 15 quid and uh, walk into the suburbs of Cardiff to my teacher's house and uh, Charlotte Church would be walking out age 10 and I'd be walking in age 16 amazing yeah amazing where did your love of and this sounds rather uh, <laughs> lardy dar but where did your love of the arts come from <laughs> what, what made you think do you know what I, I fancy a bit of singing lesson I'll have a bit of that well I didn't ever think of it as other, other, anything other than a little thing I like to do oh it really was, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, like, so going River Island working getting your cash going for singing lessons was just you for to learn how to do it properly yeah yeah, that was it, really. I mean, it, I just had one teacher in school who basically, she was a substitute teacher, and she kept me behind one day when I was about 14 or 15, and she said, you've got a really lovely voice. I was like, oh, thank you. She went, you should have some singing lessons. I said, I can't, my parents can't afford that. But she gave me on a piece of paper a number to a singing teacher, and then I kept that piece of paper until I left school at 16 and got a job and then called her up, and then that's how I started. She said, there's always something with people that we get on or people who you interview who have been successful in their field there's always a spark and all it was was that teacher of yours going yeah. you've got a pretty decent voice why don't you take some lessons people have these moments you know and a door opens and sometimes it closes and you just got to get quickly through it and who knows what's behind the door you know it's opportunities sometimes they're they're camouflaged and you don't really realise what when you were given an opportunity even as small as a phone number how much that possibly would change your life so. what were you into at that age? I did start doing Ice Stethfords, which was like the Welsh competition, talent competitions, and I'd never been good at sport. Absolutely terrible. And I started to do competitions, and I'd do them on the weekends, and the first one I did, I came on with six trophies. I won every, I won everything I was in. It was an, it was a mad, mad moment. When you studied singing, yeah. 
Did you ever think that those singing lessons that you were paying for, because you said that they were just for just for you, just for a bit of fun, mm. but did you ever think that there was a possibility of releasing albums, of being um, in big musicals with big show tunes? I think I had big dreams. I still do. And I think I definitely did have a dream, but it was sort of just like, just enjoy how it feels to think about it, not that it would come true. Yeah. It's a bit like winning the lottery, isn't it? You enjoy spending the money before you've even won it. Just the idea of it is so, so exciting, you know? And I think that's probably what I did. And I, I mean, I would watch, you know, George Michael and people of that uh, level. And you think, wow, what it must be like to be that that successful in that and sing for for a living and I that, that's probably where it would have stopped I never really thought oh yeah I'm, I'm going to have an album I'm going to do that mm. it's hard when you come from Little Village and have a bar good, you know and um, you don't really have the huge amount of opportunities a big city may present to you so you sort of have to keep your dreams sort of contained to some extent uh, next tune is Bananarama and Venus <laughs> why have you picked this? <laughs> this just reminds me of my my school years because I used to have a couple of friends called Emma and Laurie and um, <laughs> they would always have music playing and I didn't really know who Banana Rama was at the time but I knew this song and we would sing it in their front room like full I don't even know what, I mean we didn't know what we were singing about we just loved it yeah it takes me back to being in in Abba Bargoid on a summer afternoon singing this song at the tops of our voices well this is a beautiful song this this song reminds me always of my dad because my dad loves the drifters and loves under the boardwalk and I think he likes it because he can sort of what's that word you throw it and get a response so, so, was like where are we under the boardwalk oh, right. yeah, yeah. what are we doing having fun under the boardwalk he just loves to sing this song he's um, he thinks he's a bit of a singer I'll let him have it <laughs> and um, this is a song I know he would love to hear on the radio and uh, he'll be singing along with it oh was music always ever present in the always. family? My parents were very young when they had me. They were still buying singles and 45s, you know, so mm. music was a big thing. For example, when I was born on Easter Sunday, April 15, 1979, Bright Eyes just it was number one from Watership Down, this animation about rabbits. And uh, he went out and bought the, the single. I mean, that's how important music was he wanted to sort of you know remember this moment it's quite a nice song to be born on mm. that day actually it's a very beautiful song and he used to have loads of 45s my dad and so I put on the headphones and sit in the front room with the record player and I would go through every song from all the B-sides anything from the Beatles just to really random songs like really random but Tula Clark you know and then then he went through an Akabilk stage which really really didn't sit well with me but anyway there we go <laughs> listening to a clarinet on a Sunday morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of woodwind fans listen to the well, show. Well, so I like yourself. it now, but just yeah. back then when I was a teenager, not so much. <laughs> Tell us about your first theatre experience when you realised that, do you know what, this is for me. I'm oh, a bit of that. Um, so it was, I think, the first show I ever went saw, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat in Bristol Hippodrome with my mum. And I think it was Philip Schofield who was the or Jason yeah he'd just taken up from Jason Donovan and then we went and saw Sunset Boulevard Qu quite a jump from Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat to Norma Desmond played by Betty Buckley at the I think it was the Adelphi Theatre on the Strand that was the musical that really left its mark with me, weirdly not Joseph but <laughs> Norma Desmond but it was because of the performer the actor that played her uh, Betty Buckley it was an extraordinary moment watching this person sing those songs on that incredible set. And that was the moment when I just thought that she moved me so much. And I was 13, I remember being in the second row of the stalls. I don't know how we got those tickets, but we did. And I clapped so hard that she looked around the door and say thank you. And then she looked down at me and went, thank you. <laughs> and I never forget it. Love it. And my mother went, she just said thank you to you. I went, I know, I know. <laughs> Something inside me changed that day. And I thought, I want to be able to move people like she moved me. Amazing. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, well, explain to me then what it was like when you first arrive in the trailer, you're having the makeup put on for a role that you're about to play, uh -huh. you do the costume, it's your first movie, yeah. you walk out of your trailer, 
you walk onto set <laughs> explain what was going <laughs> through your head oh. because I would imagine that's probably one of the most nerve wracking moments of terrifying. any actor's career terrifying 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 and I was also dressed as Apollo one of the Greek gods in gold armour which I couldn't even walk properly I had hair extensions down to my waist which they rolled up onto my head into an Apollo knot I hadn't really done any kind of acting training for film. Or, or it was always musical theatre up until that first job I did, and I did a play um, at the Dommel before, and then got this got Clash of the Titans. And uh, just a you small, know, just a just small, a budget. small little, <laughs> just a small budget playing. You know this, and I got hair down to my waist, and I walk on set and Mount Olympus. I've got my own throne, and then next to me in the big throne is Zeus, played by the great Liam Neeson. And my uncle Hades is crossing, <laughs> crossing the, the world in front of me, and that's um, Ray Fiennes. And you're thinking, and talk about imposter syndrome. I mean, that really is a moment where I was like, what am I doing? Oh what? My How has somebody made such a mistake <laughs> that they I've actually got to the set oh before they've realised? I feel I I'm nervous just listening to the story oh with them two God. icons in there. It was terrifying. Well, let me. I'm going to skip several tunes, right? Because this is the start of your journey as you as as, as the Luke Evans that we know on the mm. billboard posters. Are you still as motivated today as you were back then? More. Are you really? More, because I have a clearer direction of where I want to go and what I want to do and what I want to achieve. Back then, I wasn't so sure. The road was there, but it was sort of hazy, and I didn't know if it was, you know, it was the road I needed to go on or wanted to go on. And um, now I'm much clearer as to what my passions are. One of the pivotal turning points for me doing Tracks of My Years was an interview we did with Johnny Marr. Mm. And Johnny Marr, obviously, the singer-songwriter of the Smiths, formerly of the Smiths, wrote some amazing tunes. And he said something that really took me aback. He said he still puts time in his diary with his agents and his manager to practice. Oh. To practice the guitar. Wow. And I thought, wow, if someone like that mm. still thinks that they have to do better, yeah. then I'm like, ugh. Yeah. All right. Well, and I also think when you're in a creative industry like songwriting, performing, acting, creating new characters, learning lines all the time, the road never stops. Only you can stop it by not progressing. But you, I learn something new on every job I do. For example, the backstage Billy. You know, this is a, a very fast-paced comedic piece, um, and I'm working with. Penelope Wilton, who is, you know, this, this incredible, incredible stage presence and incredible timing. And I'm watching going, that's how you do it. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm picking up, I'm, it's like a masterclass with Penelope Wilton every night, eight yeah. times a week, you know, and it's, uh, and I'm learning and I'm watching and I think that keeps me interested in what I do because, you know, you never... You always got to stay a bit humble too, you know. Mm. Not, no one's the best. You always yeah. have something you can do better. Right. Next up is Madness and Our House. Is this one related to the previous track, The Drifters? Yeah, Our House. My dad. Right. Because we lived on School Street, and we lived right in the middle of School Street, opposite the school that I used to go to, and um, my dad. <laughs> thinking he's really clever would sing our house in the middle of school street our house. <laughs> and as much as it used to wind me up back then it's a lovely memory that makes me giggle like it's just such a simple change of lyric but uh, that song will never be the same for me as <laughs> it always reminds me of my dad thinking he's a bit of a comedian my mum and dad we used to listen a lot to um, Paul Simon Diamonds on the Soles of His Shoes and he had the Lady Smith's Black Mambazo Choir on that album and I became quite obsessed with the sound that they made collectively it was just very different so I went to Woolworths in, Ab in Bargard in the town and um, I found the album hang on uh, hang on what did you get first pick a mix or album or album then pick a mix um, probably pick a mix first and uh, but saved enough to buy the album I used to listen to it to calm me down but also it always used to feel like if I could close my eyes I'd never been to Africa I'd never been to anywhere really at that age and I could tell that 
this music and the way that they sang was something so different to my ear and it transported me somewhere else I closed my eyes and I just thought about where they were from and what it was like you know and as a teenager I had a quite a vivid imagination and hoped that one day I would go to those places How old were you when you first travelled out? Not, not Cardiff <clears throat> to London but Cardiff to another country Well my mum and dad we went on a couple of trips when I was very very young I had a great auntie that left me a post office account and um, so they spent it on holidays <laughs> a lot of them I can't remember but uh, we went to Venice I think we went to Bulgaria nice. but the one the first one I remember was to Benidorm <laughs> <laughs> first time I, I remember being on a plane was to go to Benidorm when I was about 10 you now you you're filming in global locations mm. I would imagine I know there's a lot of studio work but you mm. do get every now and again to go to a global location yeah uh, do you have time to go and visit? Are you the kind of person that consumes your surroundings? Absolutely. I think it's it's one of the gifts I've I've been given, which I didn't think about when I became when I started doing movies and TV and the travel. The travel, the places I go, probably no one I know will ever go to some of the places I've stepped foot in, you know, in the middle of a Colombian jungle, you know, where there was this derelict old mafioso hotel that has been covered in vines, have a black scorpion crawling over my leg in the middle of the night while shooting a night sequence. But, you know, wherever you are, wherever I go, I want to be able to say, oh, I know something about that place. And I just did a, I just shot a movie in Taipei, in Taiwan. You know, I was there. We, we went through two typhoons. We swam in the oceans, rivers, waterfalls. I learned how to make dim sum for the, 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 my Shaolong Bao. So we went and did a Shaolong Bao class and I learned how to make the dough, the food. I steamed them, made bubble tea. And I just love to embrace wherever I am. It's quite easy to stay in a hotel and do nothing and watch the, watch the box when you're not working. But mm. I like to, you know discover things and I think I could write a very interesting book to be honest on the, what, my version of traveling and how I do it and what I do because I've been so many random places and I say sometimes to my, my friend who's my assistant I'm like we are the only two people we will ever meet that have, will have been to this place today. <laughs> isn't that weird like, yeah. we'll never meet anybody else that would have stepped foot right here because this is not somewhere anybody would rem ever want to go <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you should do that you should write a travel log yeah. because I think people are fascinated because we see the glitz and the glamour and the beauty of whatever you've created on the huge cinema screen we see that mm. but I think we're also fascinated by I've got a friend a very close friend of mine Rich who's obsessed by movie locations ah, obsessed yeah. like the famous ones yeah yeah. Mm. Like he's done all the Clockwork Orange. Mm. Uh, he's he's big into Forrest Gump, so he sat on the bench on the square. Oh, you know wow. all that all that yeah, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah he, he's obsessed, and and I think it's nice for us to kind of get a sense of what it takes to be or, or to be involved in a movie because yeah. we love we're a nation that loves movies. Well, the whole world loves movies. We mm. like submerging ourselves in this fantasy world, don't exactly we? Right. And I think there's, there's there's an element of us that thinks, I wonder how they did that. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean you know the secret, so I'm not going to ask you because I don't want you to dispel kind of the, the, the myths and, and the beauty that is movie mm. making do you like live music? I love live music yeah I don't well, listen to anything what was the last gig you, you went to can you remember? well actually it was um, the Ronnie Scott's residence band they were actually at my friend's house who uh, Sally Green had a Christmas party and they were all at the party and they were amazing like five singers the, the incredible jazz pianist and singer a guitar and then there was a man in the crowd in this room and he was mixing it all on an iPad so it was literally what? like it was like the best party Christmas party band I've ever seen and um they asked me if I'd sing a song with them and I sang I said I did my way with um, with with the band wow. oh, it was just fabulous but uh, wow. incredible voices so that was the last time I was in around something live but I, I I'll see anything from a small pub gig to an arena mm -hmm. um, there's something magical about thousands tens hundreds of thousands of people all focused on that one person band thing the energy of that kind of feeling of being there to watch one thing happen all of you have something in common it may be the only thing you have in common but there's something magical about live shows like theater life like our concerts is um that thing you know, we're all here for the same reason i think that's magical yeah i've mentioned it several times on the show since i started collective euphoria is one of my mm. favorite things yeah i love yeah. it absolutely love it because 
we know what it's like in the big wide world it, sometimes it's not a nice place and a lot of people have a lot of problems personal problems uh, you know which have been beset upon them and they've got to struggle and, and get through them but I think when you're in a collective euphoric space and you just turn doesn't matter who it is left right turn round usually I get sit down you're too tall <laughs> But it's just that knowing glance and that knowing stare, yeah. which I absolutely love yeah. because I'm feeling it, you're feeling it, they're feeling it, and we're all in it together. And you, you're absolutely nailed on 100% right that when you just listen and you're all there for one thing, mm. it just it's just a beautiful moment. I love it. Me absolutely too. love yeah. it. It's There's nothing like it. There's there nothing else like it. There isn't. Uh, well, let's move on to your next track. It's Something Inside So Strong. I mean, it's a beautiful track by Labby Sifri. Mm. I mean, it is. It's just a very uplifting beautiful song and um, I just love the line the walls of Jericho which the t- will come tumbling down it's about it's about so many inspiring phrases in this song which I love the way he sings it and it builds and I know we've got so many versions of it over the years but Labby's is the best what a big tune what a song what a song what a band I mean my dad again was a big fan of you can see how influenced I was by my father's music still am um, and I still love this band and I especially love this song again you know it's um, our little terraced house was filled with dire straits very very often on a Saturday afternoon or if we were in my dad's Cortina going for a drive <laughs> um, up to Brecon or something we would be playing dire straits walk of life well <laughs> tomorrow we're going to talk about Backstairs Billy we'll talk about that in depth okay I love listening and watching actors create that character mm. I think it, it, you know only obviously only a select few people can do to separate themselves and then rebuild a character mm. I think it's, it, that, that fascinates me yeah because you know I'm sure you, you've played many many characters that I'm going to talk to you about you in third person that Luke Evans wouldn't do wouldn't yeah. act mm. wouldn't behave like isn't that person no. do you know yeah. so it, it must it's, it, I find it amazing that people can just go right I'm going to drop me and then bring in this person yeah like how weird is that it's super weird yeah, yeah. And, you, and you're in that other person's skin possibly most of your waking day when you're doing a movie and maybe you get a weekend off or a Sunday off and that's the only time you actually revisit yourself and it's not easy and you pick up isms from that character it's, you know it's like I, me and Billy this backstairs Billy this char- this wonderful character that was a real person and um, who was very much loved and Oh my goodness me, he's, he's in my head all day long. <laughs> I hear my assistant coming out with lines that he says on stage, and everybody say that my partner says them. He's like, he's become part of my daily life, you know. The, Brilliant. Yeah. I love it. Of all the roles that you've played, which one was the most fun? It has to be Gaston. I mean, fun for everyone and fun for myself. I mean, he. You see, I asked you that question several years ago when we were at the Formula E, the electric motor yes, racing together. Yes. And did I say something then, else? No, you said exactly the same. Did I? So it just goes to show you mm. that that had a massive impact on you. Not just me. I am aware of how much of an impact it had on a worldwide level. Mm. It doesn't matter where I am in the world, it's Gaston. To the kids, to the adults, and it was just joyous because I've, I've described him so many different ways. But he was—he's a, a bit of a fool, but he's sort of charming with it, and he—you laugh at him most of the time, and he's unaware of it. In a way, it's <laughs> quite a blissful way to live your life. But people think he's an idiot. But he has no idea. He thinks he's—he's <laughs> he's the top dog, you know. And, and I just enjoyed playing him because obviously he's not a pleasant creature, and mm. he ends up, you know, trying to kill the beast and all that stuff, and he's pestering Bell constantly and he's not nice to his sidekick when you get given a, a role like that they don't come around every day and mm. he'll probably stay with me for the rest of my life which is um, which is a nice thing I'm happy that uh, he's connected to me you know it's, there's a few others as well but Gaston is always the one that I just think is the most fun and brought a lot of humour to people's lives have you got your Gaston at home what the figurine I do good yes when they first came out on my birthday one of my friends because there's one of Bell as well and they put Bell's clothes on Gaston and Gaston's <laughs> clothes on Bell and gave them to me for my birthday <laughs> oh thank you so much yeah, um, I like yeah, that they're still in their clothes <laughs> that's very good though yeah. Yeah. I, I do love that when you guys kind of think do you know what I will have the Gaston for you yeah, thank you very much absolutely yeah. I mean also you know when I was in The Hobbit you know that fan base loves memorabilia and mm. obviously they make it all 
in the Weta workshop and they make incredible memorabilia and they have one of me which I posed for it's about the size of a s- small shoebox right. uh, but it's actually me on, on the rooftops with my bow and arrow shooting at the dragon and it's me and it's like I've got that and it's on my shelf I don't have a lot of memorabilia but that one is really special and I have all my swords on the wall as well lovely just see, in case well, yeah, you, you never know. know you never know <laughs> because you are an actor and because you've starred in so many big movies What's it like in LA from your side of the business being an actor in Hollywood? Is, a, is, is Hollywood what we no. assume Hollywood no. is? No, I don't think so. Not a, it's never been what I thought it was. And when I turned up there um, 15, 16 years ago for the first time, it was on a screen to screen test for a movie. First time I'd ever stepped foot in a business class plane, turning left instead of right. First time I'd stepped foot into Los Angeles. And um, my, and my screen test was with um, Tom Hardy. <laughs> I was a nobody. I was like, oh my goodness me, this is terrifying. He was very lovely, and um, I didn't get the job. I, didn't, I knew I wasn't going to get it, but it was an experience I really enjoyed. L.A. has never felt to me like home, hmm. and I, they really wanted me to move there. When I say they, it was my American agents. They thought it would be better if I was there than home, but... Success and film came to me very late. I was almost 30. And I had a family and friends and a life in London and I wasn't prepared to give it all up and start again. I wanted the people that knew me when I didn't have anything. I wanted them in my life more than having big, famous Los Angeles friends. I love going there and I do enjoy the weather and I have lots of very good friends there. And it is part of my life, obviously, as a, mm. as a Hollywood actor. Well, they, well, they call it Hollywood. Nothing's made in Hollywood. Just <laughs> nothing. <laughs> they, do, they do chat chat shows, and uh, that's about it. Everything else is shot in Budapest, <laughs> Romania, well, Canada. Canada. Now. Is Canada. It Vancouver and what yeah, have you? yeah, or other parts of the states of America. You know, mm. um, I've shot maybe two movies in LA in all that time. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, mad. That's mad. crazy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is crazy. But it's a fun place, and, you know, it's a city that revolves around one industry, and that's a interesting. And the next one you've chosen is Roxy Music and Dance Away. Beautiful song, beautiful music. Again, reminds me of being early teens, still not having a huge amount of money to buy new music, so I'd be listening to my dad's collection and this was one of them but he would have bought this when I was uh, when I was a teenager so I remember it very well and I remember the the LP covers because they were beautiful they were always very colourful and had beautiful women on them bright lipstick sort of sharp spiky hair always just yeah and Brian Ferry I mean come on what a legend yeah and absolutely it's so smooth so smooth yeah Yeah. I mean his music is just so identifiable it's just him so why have you picked that glitter in the air well there's a few people I've seen in concert over the years that are just mind blowing and Pink is one of those if you ever ever have the opportunity to see her live it is a spectacular thing to behold firstly she does Air, she's on cables flying around this, this, uh, the arena she is fearless and her vocal ability is just enormous and she belts them out Glitter in the Air has always been this song which I just love the melody I love the lyric it just moves me and I just I, I think she is an extremely talented human being and I think she's probably really nice too I got a feeling that she's just nice well she was in the BBC Radio 2 Piano Room <laughs> every single person on the uh, pink BBC Radio 2 Piano Room with the BBC yeah. Concert Orchestra yeah. said she's the best oh the oh, nicest that's great. Yeah, and everything that they expected her to be so let's talk about Backstairs Billy mm. uh, it's a brand new comedy where's yes. it on first it's on at the Duke of York's on St Martin's Lane in London's glittering West End and um, we are open until the 27th of January um, it's been a glorious run joyous to be back on stage making people belly laugh at points and being with incredible actors on a stage I haven't stepped foot on in 15 years um, and London has just been gorgeous the weather the, 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 the lights the, the cold weather walking into in the evenings down St Martin's Lane I've loved every minute of it and I've missed it a lot so to be back on stage in a brand new show an original piece um, making people smile and reminisce and laugh 
with tears in their eyes <laughs> is a really lovely thing to do. We talked earlier on at the beginning of the week about Johnny Marr saying that he still practices, which really took me aback. Is it in some way, shape or form, going back on stage, fine-tuning yourself as an actor? Absolutely. I mean, something I hadn't really acknowledged or, or respected about what the, the difference between theatre and film is, but is at the fact that, you know, every night you get to do the whole story every night, the full arc, and you can really think about the nuance in every line that you deliver and sometimes change it, you know, and see if there's whoa, something... Whoa, 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 not, whoa, whoa, not hang on words. a minute, Luke Evans. <laughs> change what, my friend? The intonation, right, maybe. Okay. The, the tempo, or how you deliver it, the delivery, maybe. I mean, you don't change the words, obviously, unless no, you forget them. Unless you forget <laughs> yeah. them. Well, if you forget them, you just say anything can come out. <laughs> and that's another joy of live theatre. You know, whatever happens, the, the train keeps rolling and you keep oh, going. Oh, it sends a shiver down my spine. Oh, plan. you have had a few moments. Oh. But, it's, but it's, it's, I actually like a little bit of a hiccup in the show because it just makes everybody get really like, oh, you know, there's an energy. It that, snaps them back yes, in the room, doesn't it? absolutely. But um, it's a thing that, I get to edit myself every night. You know, you, as a, when you do film, somebody else does that long after you've finished the movie, mm. you know, in some very dark editing suite in, you know, Hollywood. But every night, you are in control of your own edit of your performance. What a great way to put it. And I really enjoy it. Mm. It's something I really, I'm enjoying it every night. I'm always, you know, I found another laugh the other night in a line, which cause, just because I looked in a different direction. I was like... That's so mad. I literally, it's the same line. I don't know anything different, but I looked in a different direction and the audience laughed. I was like, well, and that's the fun of live theatre. Yeah. You get to do it. And, and, and it How it's, interesting. I wonder what the psychology behind that is. I don't know. The physical, looking one way, doesn't really land. Mm. Looking another way. But it was by chance that I did something and it got this big reaction and it was um, so I've kept it obviously well uh, yeah that is in every so, night now so if you we talked earlier on at the beginning of the week about building that character mm. about separating yourself from the person that you're playing with live theatre like you just said you're constantly evolving not the lines or the words but the way that you move and, and the physicality of the and piece what, what the other actor is doing also you know all of that affects you and then you've got a few hundred people in the audience reacting and all of that informs every night's show for, for sure like big time amazing also what I've had the reactions I've had from him from people that knew him very very well said that somebody said it was like a, watching a master class in Billy you, 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 you nailed him and I was like well I, I don't know how I did it but I'm very happy that I've encapsulated some authenticity of who he is. and Because he was he was the, the Queen Mum's assistant, right? He was the footman to the Queen Mother. He became, he was like her butler. Billy Talon. Billy Talon. William Talon. Billy, and he was the page of the back stairs. So he became somebody that was very close to the Queen Mother throughout the 50 years that he was with her for, until she died in 2002. And they had a very close relationship he was very entertaining they they were very sociable they liked meeting people they loved a, a little tipple and he filled her life with you know dinners and parties and they'd open the odd leisure center and wherever and um he had her back in a way and stayed with her for the majority of his life wow. you know and sadly died five years after she died so they really spent most of their existence together you know mm. on this planet which is quite profound in a way yeah amazing story though mm. you know mm. uh, as, a, as a footman to have that access to the royal family and then build up a friendship with the queen mother herself yes it must be fascinating yeah. and, and a very old gentleman was at the stage door the other day and he said oh I, I was a butler with Billy and I just wanted to say he said you 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 captured him he said I said, how did you do that I said I am not really sure he said but you did he said I often think when I walk past down this street he said Billy would absolutely love the fact that there's a show about me <laughs> on the West End. He said, it makes me giggle as I wander down here sometimes and I see it. He said, God, if Billy Talon was alive just to see this on the stage. What a compliment. <laughs> what a lovely thing to say. And, um, it's very sweet. Well, the last track we're going to play for your Tracks of My Years is Johnny Mitchell and Both Sides Now. Why this? Oh, it's a very sad song to finish with, isn't it? But it is a beautiful song and weirdly always reminds me of Christmas because of Emma Thompson. Um, very weird. It's like, I've, I knew this song before, but it'll never be the same after watching Emma Thompson in her bedroom in Love Actually. And uh, her performance 
her physical performance because she says, doesn't say a single word over the soundtrack to Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now. These two things are connected forever in my head. And it's a beautifully sad, powerful song. I've got everybody's seen Love Actually. It's a Christmas, it's a Christmas go-to. But that scene for me is is a masterclass in acting, a masterclass in choosing the right song to go over that kind of acting. Mm, 100%. Well, Luke, it's been an absolute joy. Mm, I've loved it. Thank you, my friend. That was your 10-track journey on Tracks of My Ears. Luke Evans. Roll 